Welcome everyone to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Trey, and my guest today is ICR research scientist and geologist, Dr. Timothy Clary. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today, Dr. Well, Clary. It's great to be here again. So, Dr. Clary, um, those of us who went to Sunday school as kids mm -hmm. were taught that uh, when God flooded the earth uh, in Noah's day, that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but scripture indicates that the flood didn't end there. Could you elaborate? Well, yeah, it's, that's a common misconception, actually, a lot of people. I, I teach some college classes, and a lot of my students will answer that on the test question, that the flood lasted 40 days, but in reality, it lasted almost a year. And they were on the ark actually over a year. Mm. And so it's, it's a very long record of the flood in the Bible, if you keep reading. Uh, so you really look at them, 371 days, I believe, before they got off the ark. It's a lot longer than so, 40 days. And, yeah. and, and we'll, as we'll see, and we'll talk a little bit here about this, the, the flood took a long time just to get to its high point. Mm -hmm. It took 150 days, we believe, to get to the high point. The Bible's kind of clear if you count up the, the months and the days. Right. It looks like everything kind of peaked about day 150, and then after that it receded. Man, it's almost like the so, Bible giving us specific mm -hmm. numbers wants us mm -hmm. to know exactly how long it lasted. So if the flood lasted around a year, 371-ish days, mm -hmm. surely that would have major implications when it comes to the rocks. Do those rocks, the rocks that we see around the earth, show evidence for a global flood? Uh, oh, of course they do. People ask me all the time, you know, where's the evidence for the flood? And they're always trying to make the flood small. Mm -hmm. But the, the flood truly was a global flood. The Bible Everything in the Bible implies a global flood. Why would you bring birds on the ark if it wasn't a global flood? Right. And the research that I'm doing, I'm, I'm going continent by continent around the world, and I'm on my sixth continent now. And all the continents are really showing the same patterns. And that's exactly what you'd expect in a global flood. You'd expect every continent to do the same thing about the same time. And that's pretty much what we're seeing. And so it's really groundbreaking research that we're doing that hasn't really been done in 50 years or to the extent that we're doing, since there's so much more data Offshore, particularly, this has never really been done mm -hmm. on the extent that we're doing. But it's it's been a pleasure to, you know, since I've been at ICR, to work on this project and to show people the truth that God's word really is true. There really was a global flood. It's, it's just amazing to me how many people are always trying to make the flood small. Mm -hmm. You know, just a local thing, just affected the Middle East. But when you look at the rocks, we really do see a pattern uh, that's similar on almost every continent around the world. Can you elaborate on that research? Uh, well, maybe. what I'm really working on is a, a database, uh, essentially look at oil well type of data where different locations all over the world, and now I think we're up to about 3,000 columns, we call them. Okay. Stratigraphic columns, which really records the rocks at each location by latitude and longitude. So if you drilled a well right here, all the way down to the crust, we'd record how many meters in this case instead of feet. We do it in metric uh, but we what do a the, shame. Yeah, but it's just three times feet, so oh, okay. it's not a big deal. But you just, you know, how many meters or, you know, feet of limestone, sandstone, shale, all the way down to the crust. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot of similar things. And we also keep track of what we call the mega sequences. They used to be called sequences. Uh, uh, a secular geologist, Lawrence Sloss, came up with these sequences. He noticed that there was major flooding events on the continents. Now, even though the secular community doesn't believe in a global flood, they do see evidence of a lot of major floods that did take place. But they, of course, they inject millions of years in between. Right. But they do see the pattern that these continents were flooded. Now, they haven't done, again, multiple continents like we're working on, but they did see the evidence in North America mm -hmm. that there was a major, six major flooding events. And so we use those events, kind of a, instead of using words like Jurassic and Triassic, we use these mega sequences like Sauk, Tippecanoe, Kaskaskia, and those types of names. So he named them differently. Okay. Used North American tribes of people versus most of the traditional geologic time scales based on European names uh, to kind of differentiate the two. But it kind of lumps things together into six major packages. And so what happened, even the secular committee believes that the sea level rose at different times and then went down, rose and went different times. But we see that as uh, chapters of the flood. As the sea level was coming in, uh, the plate movement was causing the ocean crust to rise and ocean crust would push these tsunami-like waves higher and higher. Mm -hmm. But initially, it was a very minimal flooding. So the earliest mega sequence just shows minimal flooding. And you only see a little bit of flooding on the edges of the continents. And the second sequence, a little bit more. And the third sequence, a little bit more. And then when you get to the fourth sequence, fourth out of six, you see huge amounts of 
flooding that took place. And so mm. suddenly there was a big change. And we kind of tie that back to day 40 of the flood. Mm. When it talks about the ark was now floating or was launched, as my colleague Jim Johnson says, the Hebrew kind of implies the ark was launched or on day 40 of the flood. So we think those first few sequences might have actually been the first 40 days when you have minimal flooding. And then suddenly you have higher flooding levels. And, and we know we're flooding the land at that point right. because the ark is now being flooded. And so it might have even, early on, might have just been shallow seas being flooded. Mm. And the, the fossils reflect that to some respects. They show only marine fossils in those first three sequences. So it does really fit the data, the fossils and the rocks, and the extent of the progressive flooding that we see really does make sense and shows this is all around the world. So if there's only marine, you said marine fossils in the first three sequences, mm -hmm. what, what goes on beyond that? Well, once you get to the fourth sequence, when you see more extensive flooding, mm -hmm. and we think then you're starting to flood these kind of swampy lowland areas on the land uh, because you see animals like reptiles, and you see the first major coal seams show up all at once. And so we don't think it's a coincidence that all of a sudden you see land animals in great numbers in the fossil record. But of course, they're mixed with marine fossils as well. Mm -hmm. And you see coal seams showing up in great amounts at that same level. And so the beginning of that fourth sequence is really when things started to go bad. If you were a yeah. human and you didn't get on the ark, I remember only— like, like most of them. Right. Only eight people get on the ark. Only eight people believe there's going to be a global flood. Mm -hmm. And you know, once God shut that door, the fate of the rest of the world was sealed. And unfortunately, the animals that didn't get chosen to be two of each kind on the ark, their fates were sealed as well. Mm -hmm. And so we see a progressive flood— we see the fossils match that progressive flood, starting with shallow seas, all marine fossils for the first three sequences, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And the fourth sequence is when everything really changed. That's the what we call the Absarica sequence. Some people say Absaroka. But that sequence was the transition where now suddenly you're now flooding the land because we see that in not only the extent of the coverage gets greater, but we also see the fossils change dramatically from marine to now kind of coal seams that mm -hmm. were from swampy type plants lycopods and that sort of thing that probably lived in the coastal areas. And then also animals that lived in lowland areas, swamps, and even the dinosaurs would be part of that. Same end of the Epsarica into the next sequence is actually when the dinosaurs were buried as well. Okay. Okay, so how do, how do the sequences line up with mm -hmm. that timeline of that mm -hmm. flood, that year? Uh, you said 150 right. was the highest? Right. Well, we, we've tried to tie that in, and uh, our research has shown we think day one, of course, is when the fountains of the deep burst all mm -hmm. over the earth. And you know that's kind of started the flood, started maybe the plate movement that we see that might have been the mechanism of the flood. Right. And so we had that date locked with, with a lot of volcanic activity. There's big cracks that opened all over the earth, and we can still see the evidence for that. We can still find these big fracture systems that have lots of volcanic activity, you know, implying that they were active first. And then on top of that, we start seeing that first sequence that comes right. in a little bit later, maybe a week or two later, you start to get these big packages of sediment that come in, and they back off a little bit, and then they come in again. And so as they flooded, of course, there was a little bit of back and forth movement in between these sequences, but they didn't drain all the way off. Right. And so we see the flooding coming in. And then about day 40, the Bible talks about day 40 was another key day, as I mentioned earlier, when mm -hmm. the ark started to float. So now we know we're flooding the land. So I tied day 40 to that fourth sequence when we start seeing land animals and coal seams in great numbers. And that then if sense. you go keep going, the flood progresses. The next sequence, the fifth sequence, which shows all the dinosaurs buried all over the earth in about the same order at the same time. And you get to the top of that level, which is about the Cretaceous level. People might be familiar with Cretaceous. Right. That's the end of the fifth sequence or the Zuni sequence. Okay. And once you get to that point, I think that's about the high point of the flood because that seems to be, based in our database, where we see the maximum coverage globally and also the maximum thickness. So it's the maximum volume of rock, the maximum coverage of rock that we can still see today. It seems to be that would be the high point of the flood. And so that, to me, is around day 150. And then the last sequence is mostly the receding phase because the Bible talks about after day 150, the water started to recede. And God brought a wind to start blowing off the water, and also the ocean crust starts to sink, starts mm -hmm. to cool, the new ocean crust is starting to cool, and that's to cause the ocean basins to sink. So you start to bring the, the net result is the water started to drop. But there was this point around day 150, which we tie to about the end of the Zuni, or the fifth mega sequence, 
which we can tie to about the end of the Cretaceous level globally. This mm -hmm. seems to be the, again, the maximum coverage, maximum thickness to us that shows, you know, that's the high point of the flood. Okay. That's Did fascinating. That sense yes, you? absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you've explained that very mm -hmm. well. So then 150 is the end of the fifth mega sequence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so mm -hmm. you mentioned the receding period. Uh, how long was that receding period then? Well, well, the receding period, we based on, again, if you read the Bible and the way we think the wording comes out, it looks like based on kind of how you interpret the Hebrew, I think it's in Genesis 8 where it talks about Noah looked out and the earth was dry. And it appears that that means the whole earth. So around day 314, the water might have, from day 150 to day 314, the water might have actually been draining off. And that provided the rocks and the sediment a lot of it shifted offshore. The sediments are drained. The mountains were popping up. And uh, amazingly, about 80% of the world's mountains all pop up at the wow. same time in the beginning of that sixth sequence, the Tejas mega sequence, it's called. Even the Himalayas didn't form until into the mega sequence, the last mega sequence. So a lot of mountain building was going on. A lot of that had to do with plate movement that was moving very rapidly and the earth was kind of equilibrating. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it gets a little more complicated than that. But... Uh, you over thicken the crust and the crust pops up. It's, it's thick below, kind of like a cork. Okay. And so the kind of crust kind of goes up and down at the same time. So all these mountains were popping up. So the, the world really didn't have this you know, Mount Everest in the pre-flood world. We didn't have to flood the world 26,000 feet. The highest elevation in the pre-flood world might have only been four or 5,000 feet for all we know. And I'm going to try to work on that with some of my research. But to me, the, what's amazing is the, the data that I'm collecting. It's data-based research because mm -hmm. it's based on the rocks is really confirming exactly what the Bible says. And, and you can kind of tie it into those key dates that the Bible gives us. And it's, it's, it's fascinating mm -hmm. that you can use the same data, and if you just approach it from a different standpoint, mm -hmm. you come up with a, a very reasonable explanation with the global flood as opposed to these millions of years that mm -hmm. evolutionists will, will, will claim. Well, again, the, the lack of evidence between the layers. Mm -hmm. You know, you see there's some erosion. They talk about these are marked by erosional boundaries. But the erosion is this flat erosion. You, it's kind of, as the waves kind of come in like tsunami waves, as they go in, they also go back out. Right. And so you're going to get a little bit of erosion off the top each time, but it doesn't mean there was millions of years. Right. It could have just been a few days, maybe a week, a few hours. You know, it depends on the layer. And so there's a lot of moving in and out of the waves, but there were these major packages, these six major packages, five rising and then one receding. But wow. you can see a progressive flood really does match exactly with what Genesis 7 tells us, all the way up to day 150. And then Genesis 8 really talks about the receding phase going down. But it's uh, to me, it's it's fascinating because you can see that the truth of God's work mm -hmm. right before as the work I'm doing, you know, as I put together these kind of methodical process that I'm going through, collecting all this data all over the world, put these data points in, and when you get the, the maps and the results, uh, you can see... God's word is true. Wow. There was a global flood. Yeah. I don't know how else you explain it. And you know, since I put out the book Carved in Stone, people have read it, you know, atheists have read it, and they don't complain about my data. They, you know, they say, well, we like your data, Tim. We just don't like your interpretation. But they don't really offer a better interpretation to explain it. When you look at the global picture, it all screams global flood. Right. Wow. It's fascinating. I... I uh, have to admit that I'm not very well versed in geology, uh, of course, um, but it, it sounds like it, like you're, if you look at the data mm -hmm. and you actually like look at the rocks, then it shows what the scripture says is true, which is, I mean, what we expect to see as, as creationists. Mm -hmm. um, there's no need to insert other millions of years that don't mm -hmm. exist, that, that there's no real evidence for. Um, any closing thoughts? Any Anything that you want to touch on here? Anything our viewers and listeners, you'd like them to know? One thing I wanted to mention, maybe I didn't mention enough, is the, the data we're collecting yeah. is actually a lot of it is oil well data. Okay. And, you know, and your, your background yeah, is Yeah, and that. I see God's hand in my yeah. background preparing me for this. You know, Little did I know, I thought I'd have a long career in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. I started out you know, with the oil and gas company, collecting data, looking at this type of stuff. So I understand the data I'm collecting maybe better than than some of the academics out there who never worked in oil and gas. Right. And so I think God's hand was, involved, you know, kind of training me in oil and gas. And then and then I got laid off because I had no plans of getting a PhD, but God had plans for me. I just didn't know. <laughs> and good. so it's kind of amazing how I look back now, I see God's hand 
you know, even though I'm a sinner and he still cares for me, he still forgives me and he still allows me to do things that he has always wanted me to do. And so in a pers- kind of a personal story, I, I really do see that, you know, God finally called me to ICR at age 52. Now, I'm just kind of glad I wasn't as old as Moses at 80 <laughs> uh, to, 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 to finally start doing what he, I think, had planned for me to do all along. Right. And to, to show people there really was a global flood. You know, and I'm, I'm nobody special, uh, just, but I have the training to understand what I'm doing and, and be able to prepare this data set. And it really is database research. Mm-hmm. It's the way research should be done. Because we just started looking at plot the data and said, let's see what the data shows. Mm-hmm. And this, the data shows and confirms exactly what the Bible tells us. And now you are just a tool mm-hmm. in the hand of the creator, mm-hmm. just as, as we all are. Awesome. Fascinating. I love hearing the personal stories mm-hmm. um, about how, especially how God brought some mm-hmm. of the scientists to ICR mm-hmm. and, and now what they're able to do and um, giving God the mm-hmm. glory, right? That's right. And we actually do have a copy of your book here, uh, Carved in Stone. Uh, this is a uh, pretty thick, pretty robust book um, full of a lot of information. Mm-hmm. And I know you've worked long and hard on this, and it's not just the first one, right? There's going to be a second right. volume at some right. point. Right, that's, that's half the world. And okay. so that's about 500 pages. And so we'll have to add the other three continents in because we really can't do much with Antarctica. Right. Uh, a little bit, but uh, you know, it'll. It, but what we're seeing as I'm working on those other continents, we're seeing the same pattern. Awesome. You know, progressive flood, just like the Bible describes. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Clary. I hesitate to say this, but I'm going to say it for all of our viewers and listeners. You rock. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> that is a horrible pun, but we're going to let it ride. To all of our viewers and listeners, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. We're so glad that you were here. As a reminder, this podcast is available on YouTube. It's also available wherever else you might get your podcasts. Make sure to like, subscribe, give us a rating, share. Please share this podcast with your friends and family. We'd love to get this truth out. Uh, And with that, I'm Trey, and this is The Creation Podcast. We'll see you next time.